Many times we need to keep our health in check, but don't know what questions to ask or where to begin. We walk in blindly to our health care provider and walk out none the wiser and maybe even more confused than before. Can you take charge of your health and arm yourself with the questions and preparedness you need? The answer is yes. Welcome to Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs. This program will answer your questions and give you the best practices for facing your medical partner in good health. Now, here's Dr. Susan Downs. Welcome to Occupy Health. This is Dr. Susan. We're talking about how to keep healthy and how to be proactive to keep our bodies running optimally as long as we can. And that's very important. And where do we get this information? Well, I have not found clinicians, well, with a few exceptions, to be much help with this area. But today we have somebody that can help us a lot. We have uh, Vincent Guliano. And he will tell us a lot about how we can extend our lifespan in a very healthy way. So talking a little bit about him, uh, he states as a follower and connoisseur of longevity, research was his latest career. He's been part-time at this for several decades, but in 2007, this has become his mainline activity. He's published over 200 books and papers in his early career, as well as 440 substantive entries in his blog, which is www.agingsciences.com. We will repeat that later. Many of these are systematic reviews, articles dealing with topics relating to longevity and health, and numerous citations to recently published literature. In his early reincarnations of his career, he was a founding dean of a graduate school and a university professor at the State University of New York. He was a senior consultant and group lead working in a variety of fields at Arthur D. Little and the chief scientist and chief operating officer of Mirror Systems, a software company and an international consultant contributing to the early development of the Internet. How exciting that is. He got off the ground with one of the earliest PhDs from Harvard in a field that later became known as computer sciences. There was no academic field at that time, so he had to qualify himself in hard scientist, science. In various ways, he contributed to the computer revolution starting in the 1950s and the Internet revolution in the 1980s, so clearly he has a lot of foresight and insight. He's now engaged in doing the same thing for the longevity revolution. He's had several careers, some periods of mild notoriety. If you Google him, you will find many things. But his, uh, most of his writings you can get at www.vincegiuliano, we'll spell that at the end of the period and it will be on the website, or www.guglianoart.com, or veguglianno at agingsciences.com. And so, welcome to the show, Dr. Guglianno. Good to be here, Susan. Good to be here. Well, so, where would you like me to start? Well, we want you to share our vi- wisdom, so my job is to figure out how to get it out of you. So I notice that kids are not living as long as their parents. So what's going on? Is the U.S. life extension dropping off? Well, um, for a number of years, actually since uh, Cro-Mangan times or the early years of our species, um, the average lifespan has been increasing. Uh, Just in the last year, it seems to be leveling off or maybe dropping a bit, and uh, there may be various factors for that, but the the long-term historical trend is very clear. Um, A hundred years ago, you were lucky to make it to 50. Uh, Today, the average uh, lifespan from birth is a little more than... 80 years, maybe 81 or 82 years in some European countries. And um, uh, in the, uh, when we were cavemen, most people did not make it beyond about 22. So that the, evol- uh, the pattern of evolution is longer and longer lifespans. And this is because of an interaction of um, biological evolution and social evolution. Like socially, we've evolved vaccines, uh, clean water, clean air, sewage systems, 
we've come to understand what microbes are, what sanitation is. There's just a whole bunch of things uh, that have allowed us to improve our uh, lifespans. And in recent years, for example, uh, fewer and fewer people are smoking. Well, but our but the expectancy of our children is less. So what's going on there? I I don't think it's less. Um, uh, I I think that in the United States, uh, as contrasted with many other countries, we drop down in measures of health, longevity. Um, uh, ability to survive the first four years or so forth down to 37th or 42nd place. So that in the United States, um, uh, a lot of those public health things um, that used to be very important for us are not so important anymore. But that's, uh, I think, far outweighed by what's happening in the world where the tendency is towards longer and longer lifespans. Okay. All right. Um, so is the life expectancy any greater in Europe? Um, yeah, it's greater in many European countries than it is here. As I said, we're down, at, if you look at a number of health indices, um, there are many countries that we think of as third world countries that are actually better than us. Okay. Uh, this is just um, where we put our effort as a society in recent years and um, just a, a fact of life. But if you look at world patterns, uh, I think there's every chance to be optimistic. Well, where are we putting our resources that we're not doing as well as some countries? Well, you're, you're carrying me off into um, uh, a political discussion um, uh, we believe in free enterprise uh, in a market system where the market system uh, works in the interest really of very, very large players now, not individuals anymore. I'm a great believer in the market system, by the way, but so, you need a fair market system. And uh, so that the uh, socially, if you look at social legislation, and social developments, we've just fallen behind. I mean, look at Holland or look at Sweden or the Scandinavian countries or even Germany. Uh, they're far ahead of us. And even countries like Korea, South Korea, which we thought of as a third world country, um, uh, exceeds us in many dimensions. Okay. Well, let's not get into the politics because I believe in the free market system as well and think it's the best in the world. But obviously, it can be tweaked. I think my listeners figured out where I stand on that. So, let's. Uh, what is your personal background for this conversation on longevity? Well, um, uh, roughly about um, 12 years ago, I decided to come out of retirement. I was an artist, a digital artist, and I just didn't feel that that work was making a big difference. So in my 70s, my mid-70s, I said, gee, what could I do with the rest of my life to make the most difference? And I decided to become a longevity scientist, that is, uh, to study the literature and the developments having to do with human lifespans and to understand them. Uh, just for myself initially, but then I found I couldn't understand this stuff. It's too complicated. Unless uh, I picked one topic and wrote it all out for myself. So I did that. And after a while, I said, gee, I thought to myself, I'm writing these long treatises on topics like uh, telomeres or uh, various topics in molecular biology. Why don't I share them? So... I started a blog, uh, www.agingsciences.com, and pretty soon I had followers, and if you fast forward to today, um, I have something like 120,000 registered users plus uh, a number of others, maybe a few hundred thousand worldwide followers of the blog. Um, there's over 540 Articles there, many of which are review articles and detailed topics, and 
I feel like and now I can largely read and understand this stuff, but it's very widely. And um, in addition, I've been asked to be a speaker, and I have developed many colleagues in the aging sciences. So I've kind of uh, made the trip over a period of about 12 years. The blog is about nine years old. So um, it's, it's basically I put my mind to that. I've decided that was the way I could contribute. Uh, because Basically because I feel if we're healthy and can live longer, we'll have more wisdom, and we can bring that wisdom to our social decision-making, and that can be a contribution to society. If we could just add a few years to people's lifespans, it might add significantly to the ratio of long-term thinking versus short-term thinking. So that's what I did, and um, uh, I'm still with that program now. That's exciting. I like the idea of the older generation passing on its wisdom to the rest. That is great. So what is aging? What is its essential nature? Well, I, I believe, not all researchers believe this, but I believe the evidence is definitely in that it's a program. That when we're born, obviously, from the minute of conception, something takes over an, an inexorable, extremely complicated process that leads us uh, to develop as a fetus in utero, later to develop as an infant, to go through stages of development. And I am convinced that that program or a program that is a continuation of that developmental program lasts lifelong, and it ends with killing us for sure. Um, it, it, it's not that some of us can live to 100 or 2 or 300. It makes sure it kills us all off by 122. And that's because evolution really wants to protect the species, uh, the human species, rather than the individual. And based on um, uh, the way things used to be in history during most of the uh, several million years of evolution and the hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution, that meant you didn't want the old people consuming too many resources or dominating the younger people. So uh, it's a program. And um, uh, the good news for older people who want to live longer is that being a program, I think it can... to some extent be hacked. We don't fully understand the program, but there's a number of hacks that can keep us living longer and healthier uh, that we do know about and we can pursue, and that's the good news in that. So what are some of these hacks? So, I mean, obviously the younger folks can look at this as prolonging their lifespan. It's not only for the older folks. So what are some of these hacks? Is there going to be a major scientific breakthrough, do you think? Or do we have to do this incrementally with a lot of different hacks in a, little diff- in a lot of different well, areas? I, I think we have to do it incrementally with a lot of different hacks. I mean, the um, idea of a fountain of youth or of a single breakthrough, a longevity pill that will make you live longer is very appealing to us, and it's in our collective unconscious. You know, vampires live forever, and uh, Dr. Faustus sold his soul to the devil uh, so he could live a long time. But um, I, I think it takes many, many different incremental things because the program that kills you is very, very multifaceted. It has many different aspects of aging. And unless you address all those aspects, you're not going to live much longer. Or a a simple way to look at it is uh, consider the question, what's the one thing I can do that will keep my car going forever? Well, there isn't one thing you can do. You know, if rust doesn't get you, then engine wear out will get you, or some other parts will wear out, or uh, this number of things can go wrong with a car. You have to do lots of things to keep a car going. So we're maybe a thousand times more complicated than a car. So that means that the number of things we have to do to keep us going 
are just very, very large. I, 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 w- I would love to think that there is a magic pill um, that will enable us to live for a very, very long time. And there may be some treatments that will enable us to live significantly longer, but I don't think it's one thing. I think it's a number of incremental things if we want to live healthily. And, that, you know, that, that's what I've done for myself. Besides being a scientist studying this, I'm a self-hacker. I pursue interventions, I think, that are going to keep me going. And um, I'm 88. I don't have any of the um, diseases of degeneration that kill most older people. Um, I feel that my mental capacity, my productivity is as good as it was when I was 55. And I think I can keep going for a number more years. So uh, I, uh, that approach is working for me. And I've already beat the odds by 15 years. I think it's fairly easy to beat the odds by or, or to beat the life expectancy tables by 15 to 25 years. It gets much tougher if we try and push it beyond that, at least in terms of what's known now. So we have to work at this? Please? We have to work at this to keep healthy? Yeah, we do. We do. Or, or we, we, we have to... If, if, because this program is like climbing a mountain... They get steeper and steeper and slipperier and slipperier the older you get. The more you have to work at it to not fall off the mountain. Uh, eventually, that mountain has you upside down on a slippery surface, and you have to really work hard at it. I, I don't think it's something. Uh, it's something where there's a lot of habits, a lot of things you can do, and you can just integrate them into your lifestyle, and then you don't have to think about them. But uh, you you just can't follow the usual things and expect any result to be different than the usual result, which uh, leads to average lifespans of about 80 right now, with people really getting all kind of degenerative diseases in their 70s. Yeah, the average picture right now now is not very good. A large percentage of us have chronic diseases, and about 25% probably have more than one chronic disease over a certain age. And so it doesn't sound pretty if you're uncomfortable in your later years. So I don't think the average expectancy of what's going to happen it looks very promising at this moment, doing what we're doing now. Yeah, I, I think doing what we're doing now doesn't work. Um, I, I like to tell a little story um, that I think you may have heard me speak before on that the greatest longevity achievements uh, in the last 30 years have been automobiles. Um, cars used to start to crump out and rust out and die in three years and 50,000 miles and now, if you have Subarus in your family, which my family has, you can expect two or 300,000 miles and uh, 15 to 20 years of lifespan. And I this was not as a result of any single breakthrough innovation, but something called total quality management, which meant you carefully monitored what you did. You innovated, experimented, found out what worked, stayed with that, and then went on to the next innovation. And some of those can be really tiny or small. Um, uh, like one of my favorite small ones is getting up from the desk and walking around a little bit every hour or so. So keeping your body moving. Um, and some of them can be very, uh, some of the uh, things that I'm experimenting with are very avant garde, and some of them are. Uh, new things I don't even want to talk about now until I am convinced that they really work for me. Oh, those are the ones I really want to hear about. But like the automobile, it sounds like health might be a multifactorial issue. There are many different subsystems in the automobile, and there's many different metabolic pathways and things going on in the body. So it sounds like health is a multifactorial 
event, which makes uh, it sense that uh, various interventions of different kinds might be able to help. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. That's right. And uh, and you might need many different interventions. That is, you might have interventions that will uh, keep you very sharp and make sure you don't get Alzheimer's or dementias, but still let your muscles atrophy. Um, so that um, uh, we have to constantly... it. We, we don't know how to live, um, what it takes, really, to assure um, longevity, and by that I mean 100 to 120 to maybe even beyond that in years. Um, it probably varies highly by individual, and we have to be willing to use the best knowledge available and experiment with ourselves because we're all different. So before we get to some of these individual hacks, which we're all waiting to hear, can you tell us what's the essential nature of aging and what are the most important things to know about aging? Well, um, first of all, aging uh, is a universal biological response. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about single-celled organisms, viruses, chimpanzees, nematodes, fruit flies, uh, Egyptians or modern humans, uh, we all age. Secondly, every species has a typical lifespan that they live. And um, this varies by species and can range from uh, probably a minute or Sorry, ranging in minutes or seconds to probably a millennia for certain trees. Um, so that, um, and it's a universal thing. And the other thing about aging is that, as I said, um, nature, evolution, or God, I don't care whether you want to say that this was evolution or the work of God, it doesn't matter. Uh, what, whatever it is, it cares more about the species than the individuals, and it also provides the mechanisms that we are beginning to understand that species use to evolve to different species when they're too stressed out, when their own existence is threatened. Um, uh, next thing to say is that the lifespan of an individual is very, very tiny compared to the lifespan of um, astronomical entities or a solar system, and that even the lifespan of species are very, very tiny. So um, uh, those are some important things about aging. Um, I don't think that it will ever be possible to live forever, um, at least not in human bodies, because we were not engineered that way. We weren't built that way. We were, we were, we were built to be part of the species mechanism. Um, there are people who talk about uh, transferring our intelligences into machines or resuscitating or freezing our bodies uh, to resuscitate them at a later time. Uh, I don't have much patience for that. It's not scientific, uh, and uh, I don't give that much heed personally. I, I just think that um, we are designed to age. We shall age. We may extend our lifespans probably um, uh, we can get it to where most people can live to 100 or maybe 115, possibly. Um, whether we can extend our lifespans beyond the maximum known human lifespan, the maximum documented lifespan of 122 years, I don't really know. I think there are some interesting ideas there, 
um, but it's certainly far from anything that's in practice right now. What is going wrong with what's in practice? What are the causes of us aging prematurely? Well, um, there are lots of things that can cause us to age prematurely. It's like lots of things can go wrong with your car, okay? Um, uh, We can age prematurely by being exposed to too much stresses of many different kinds, Uh, toxics, chemicals, toxic stresses, um, uh, too much exercise, too much of almost anything can cause us to age prematurely. We can age prematurely because of oxidative stress, that is, because of things which cause our cells to oxidate too rapidly. Um, we can ca- we can age too rapidly because uh, some of our uh, biological pathways are not functioning well, and this could be due to a genetic disorder, but most likely is due to environmental disorder. I would say that eighty uh, that only uh, genetics is only important for ten or fifteen percent of how long of you age, and even if you most have scientists age, agree with this, by the way, most pardon? scientists most scientists agree with you on that point. Most of it is environmental and our lifestyle choices. Absolutely, absolutely, that's well documented. And um, as you may know, that uh, there was a great focus twenty years ago um, sequencing the human genome and understanding what our genes do. But now the focus is shifted to epigenetics, which is what activates our genes, what turns them off, what keeps them in healthy balance. That is, um, the genes which uh, are, are spread out on our chromosomes are like, uh, imagine a long string and you have uh, a foot between uh, one diamond and the next diamond, and the two diamonds are genes. Well, everything in between there is called epigenetic material, and that is responsible for our development, the program of our life, um, and um, is uh, was thought of to be junk DNA, but actually that DNA controls everything about us. Um, You have the same genes in the cells of your big toe that you have in your brain that are in the cells in your tongue, that are in the cells in your liver, the cells in your heart. Uh, The difference is epigenetic. It's what activates those genes, what turns them on. And what we're concerned about now is what are the genes you want turned on and turned off at different parts of your life cycle so you can lead a happy, productive, and long and contributory life. That's the basic name of the game right now. Well, in epigenetics, doesn't it involve methylation, histones, and acetylation? It does. Um, uh, it involves the um, the acetylation of histones, uh, which are sort of the little uh, bundles that um, wrap up our DNA. Uh, and and um, I think it involves the methylation of DNA. Now, uh, let me say something about this. Uh, um, uh, methyl groups are well known in chemistry and can be attached to various places to certain organic molecules. And it now appears that there is a systematic pattern of methylation that applies lifelong as we to our genes. And um, uh, clocks of aging have been developed. You know, we can tell how old somebody is kind of by looking at them, is their hair gray, and are their teeth falling out, 
or uh, they sort of blurble instead of talk well. But um, objectively, we've been looking for a good clock that measures how old we are biologically, um, actually biologically. And uh, it's been found that certain um, genes tend to be methylated, become methylated um, as you grow older, and certain genes have tended to lose methylation as you grow older. And in the last five years, some researchers developed, have identified clocks that are very, very predictive of your biological age by looking at the methylation patterns. And um, uh, the prob- probably one of the best clocks available now is one by a company on the West Coast Coast called Zymo Research. It looks at over a thousand genes, and uh, you can buy tests for them that will give you a pretty good guess at how old you are biologically. Um, I had this uh, test run two weeks ago, and I think I'm a lot younger biologically than I am chronologically, but I haven't got the test results back yet, so I'm looking forward to getting them. So uh, methylation, we want to methylate, turn on the good genes, and we want to turn off the bad genes, but this pattern changes over life. And there's certain supplements that we take that will turn on the good genes and turn off the bad genes and certain things we can do. So it sounds very complex. Yes. Uh, well, I am, um, if, if, uh, absolutely. Uh, there's things we can do, and I believe that uh, the thing about these clocks is that you can reverse some of the methylation patterns and actually... Uh, I, I would not have said this last year, uh, but I now am willing to say it. I think we can actually, in selective dimensions, actually reverse aging now. That's the really exciting thing. This field of aging research is crazy. It's um, unfolding in a way uh, that we never thought it would in a dramatic way. And I just want to be around to see where it goes. So um, what dimensions and uh, subsets can we actually reverse the aging clock? Tell us more about that. Well, we don't know for sure, but we have a lot of research studies coming in that suggest, for example, that we may be able to uh, prevent or reverse um, dementia and Alzheimer's. Yes, Dale Bredesen's doing a lot of work on that. And once again, his approach is it's multifactorial. He says there's like 50 holes in the roof, and you find out which hole's causing the biggest problem, and you address that. And he also sees toxins as one subset. He's actually reversing cognitive decline in people, which is really exciting. Is that what you're referring to, or are you referring to other uh, yes, studies? Yes, I think he's, well, Bredesen, Neil Bredesen's um, paper on that, of these simple interventions, just a whole bunch of simple interventions, um, was quite a breakthrough piece. Uh, I think now um, we're also seeing big pharma weighing in with advanced drugs, uh, uh, monoclonal antibody treatments, uh, new generation monoclonal antibody treatments that uh, may allow us to put uh, Alzheimer's into the past. And, uh, I mean, Neil's stuff is great. It's it's simple and practical. It's things people can do. I'm a great believer in that. Um, some of the new developments might enable us to forestall um, dementias completely. So, well, a note to the listener, you can listen to my interview of Dale Bredesen, which was posted on August 18th of this year. So you can learn more about that from him. 
by checking out that podcast. But what other areas is aging being reversed? I mean, my picture of things is the risk factors for cardiovascular disease are similar for the risk factors for Alzheimer's and many other things. So I would assume that these approaches would work for many different uh, problems. Well, well, they would. Um, you know, uh, I am uh, mainly, I most of my years, I've, believe in natural supplements, uh, the power of the nature has had to evolve stress-resistant chemicals and their powerful effects. Um, however, uh, there is a whole exciting new class of development that just broke in the last couple months, um, having to do with uh, preventing cardiovascular diseases, uh, something called PSK9 inhibitors that uh, make statins obsolete. Um, and oh, thank that, goodness. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the, 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 the uh, traditional pharmacological approaches to these things has been, uh, we don't really want to cure anything. What we want is something that people have to take the rest of their lives to manage their situations. Um, but uh, it could be that with these uh, new class of PSK9 inhibitors. Um, we can prevent uh, cardiovascular disease not by turning off cholesterol in every cell, which is what statins do. Um, and that's bad because we need a certain amount of cholesterol. Absolutely. We need it for development. Uh, you don't Absolutely. want to turn it off, and that's what statins do. Cell uh, walls but, for, for hormones, sex hormones, we have to have it. Yeah, we have to have it. In fact, everything bad about aging was good at one point. IGF-1 is regarded as a horrible, evil thing of aging. Well, it's part of natural development. We need it. Inflammation uh, is one of my favorite topics. Um, oh, yeah. Speaking of that, let's veer off to stress and how we deal with stress, and we'll segue into inflammation uh, as an extension of that. So tell us about stress. It's not all bad, is it? No. I am convinced. If, if, for one thing, is if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't exercise, you're going to lose muscle mass and muscle capacity. Uh, if you don't take on serious mental or intellectual challenges or social challenges, you'll lose your mental capabilities. Um, you, you need a certain amount of stress uh, to exercise facilities. And there is a whole branch of aging sciences called hormesis or hermetic interactions which shows that a little bit of stress produces a strong stress resistance and strength in your bodies. Um, and so you, you want to have stress. You need stress. Too much stress of any dimension will kill you. A little stress of many, many dimensions, for example, radiation. Uh, is a little bit of radiation bad? No, there's plenty of research now that shows a little bit of radiation is good for you because it upgrades radiation defenses. And um, uh, we as biological entities, um, going back to when we were cyanobacteria floating in a primordial audience of maybe a billion years ago, that's a long time back, um, we're experiencing stresses, radiation stresses, cold stresses, hot stresses, and we have evolved an incredible vocabulary of reactions to those stresses in our body systems. We need to exercise them to keep healthy. Um, too much stress of any kind will kill you uh, or will rapidly debilitate you. It will also trigger a very strong genetic response, epigenetic response, which my colleagues and I have researched, which triggers, which tells evolution, okay, evolution, we've got a problem. We maybe need to evolve to a new way. 
and evolution starts to look at every segment of DNA that we've had going back our entire history of organisms and says, well, this solved the problem, well, that solved the problem, what can solve the problem? Evolution goes into a problem-solving mode, and that's why when we evolve, it isn't just randomly, it's in a direction that helps us deal with the stresses we're encountering. Okay, so an example of this might be an ischemic preconditioning. If we put the blood cr- pressure cuff on us uh, very tightly so the blood doesn't flow, that we can increase our blood flow by 40%? Amen. Yes. And uh, there's a stress response conference every year. I've gone to a lot of them. And ischemic conditioning, there's many forms of conditioning. You want to be an athletic performer, you condition your body by exercise. You want to solve aging, you take on aging as a problem. And you, uh, and believe me, that's a mental challenge. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you, um, uh, but there are many forms of conditioning. There's cold stress. For example, Um, One of my little interventions is that every night when I go to bed, um, I take off my clothes. I'm in a bedroom that's in New England now, about 58, 60 degrees, and I get really cold. And I get cold in the morning, too, when I get dressed. I allow myself to get cold. Well, I know that this activates a number of heat shocks proteins and cold shock proteins, which are well-defined, and those end up making me stronger. Okay? Yeah, some, some researchers would say that one way to help detox is you take get yourself in a cold bath and then a hot bath and then a cold bath and then maybe follow up with Epsom salts or skin brushing, but it sounds like a lot of people are coming to similar conclusions. Yeah, and you find them in different people. There's bunches of people who do hot saunas. They activate heat shock programs. Um, there's a bunch of polar bear swimmers who dive under the ice in the middle of the winter and get cold. Uh, there's people who uh, go in the cold and make snow angels with their naked bodies and then jump in hot saunas. I used to do that a few years back. Um, uh, but there's good reason to believe Uh, that those stresses are very, very useful. And as I said, the whole field of exercise conditioning is a field of stress conditioning. So is basic training in the Army or the Navy, where they put you new soldiers under lots of stress because they know that's going to make them better soldiers. So the, the whole field of stress conditioning is a field, I think, where people can study, ordinary people can do that without uh, learning very, very complicated aspects of molecular biology and benefit from that for conditioning. So you're saying some stress is better than no stress? Yes, I'm going further than that. I'm saying if you want to live long, you need stress. You need physical stress and you need mental stress. Can you give us some examples? Would caloric restriction be such an example? Yes, that's a good example. Caloric restriction uh, stresses your metabolic systems. Uh, It activates, it upgrades certain proteins. It it suppresses certain pathways like mTOR and IGF-1 and produces a healthy body response. Um, it also increases the sirtuins and the FOXO gene as well and many other positive pathways. Yes, yes, yes. Remember the song, Oh, the Fox Went Out on a Chilly Night? No. Um, oh, the Fox went out on a chilly night looking for sirtuins to make him bright. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Before my time. <laughs> Pardon? Before my time. Before your time, okay. Um, Yes, um, uh, sirtuins are very, very important, and they're very, very important, and the 
research on metabolic pathways, the NAD pathways is very, very important and leads us to a number of practical understandings. So, um, oh, let me just shut up for a minute and ask you where you want to take it right now. Well, I think the listener can mo- listeners can most benefit by giving them examples of what they can do in their own lives. Uh, yeah. What would you okay. think? First of all, monitor what makes you brighter in the morning and what gives you energy and what takes energy away. Uh, I would suggest to you that um, some of the simple things, start with simple things, because unless you can make it to 90 and then 100, you ain't going to make it to 110 and 120. So start with simple stuff. Um, We uh, are all evolved uh, in a cycle of daylight and night, so we all have circadian rhythms, so our body patterns work better when we have regular patterns of sleep and awakeness. So first of all, uh, respect your own body patterns of being sleepy and awake. Uh, And respect your uh, daily uh, circadian clock. Um, um, Treat your, as I talked about stress, diet is of course extremely important. there's tons and tons and tons of conventional wisdom out there about healthy diet. Most of it pretty good. I personally believe in a um, Mediterranean-type diet with lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are alive. The cells in them are still alive. Can you imagine that, that when you eat a fruit and vegetable, you're eating live entities. You're the, the apple cells, you eat of a fresh apple or uh, of a piece of celery, they're alive cells. Those cells have stress response. When you eat them, they immediately say, help, 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 I'm going to upgrade my own stress chemicals. And those chemicals are biological, those stress channels that are activated in the celery cell are evolutionarily conserved in us. So we get the benefits of, of eating of, of, that they have of their own hormesis when we eat fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, uh, a probably good idea, not eating too many meats or preserved meats. Oh, there's a lot of argument about that. Uh, it's probably a good idea to eat uh, a fair amount of fish. I am not a religious adherent or a strong a dietary believer in any one dietary protocol. But I can't say lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, minimize uh, processed meats because they have certain chemicals in them, probably minimizing meats, uh, lots of fish. Um, we were once fish. We ate other fish. We benefit from fish oil. And... Um, uh, let me segment our way there. To, there are certain dietary supplements now that finally, 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 the medical establishment is beginning to, it poo-pooed them for years, but now it's beginning to acknowledge their importance. Plenty of vitamin D3, at least 3,000, I do 10,000 IU a day of vitamin D3. Um, plenty of um uh, fish oils or essential omega-3 oils. We eat far too many omega-6s. We need lots more omega-3s. And then I would say there is a large number of supplements that um, I date from uh, ancient Ayurvedic times, from ancient Chinese medicine and ancient uh, Indian medicine that have shown up all over the world. So these supplements have names, uh, uh, different names in different Ashwagandha, cultures. ginseng. We covered those last week in our talk on spices. But yes, absolutely correct. These have shown the test of time. Yeah, and and many of those uh, uh, upgrade your 
anti-inflammatory responses. Um, most diseases, when you get old, when you get above 75, above 85, into my age range, um, almost all the diseases that kill you are diseases of extremely high inflammation, um, uh, high systemic inflammation. We need inflammation. If we didn't have inflammation, we wouldn't have wound healing. We wouldn't live. But That's a hormetic principle. We need a little inflammation going on to trigger things in the right way. We only have about three minutes left. So okay. I would well, you let know, me just maybe say you that comment control on the ketone diet and then summarize any extra points you would like to. Yeah, and let me just focus on inflammation. Control of systemic inflammation, I think it's the key thing that older people can do. You can do this with supplements, um, uh, ashwagandha, ginger, uh, boswellia, curcumin, which curcumin are very important ones. And then I'm going to do something which uh, I disclose is a self-serving something, uh, my inflammatory indices are off the scale low. They're characteristic of a person in the age 20s, and this is because I've been pursuing um, use of a dietary supplement we've developed ourselves, which has very high bioavailability. Um, it's curcumin. It combines ancient Ayurvedic knowledge with nanotechnology for high bioavailability. Well, I think we might have lost Vincent temporarily on our phone call here, but he's about to talk about inflammation and that he's got a supplement developed that will help with inflammation. It sounds like his uh, supplement has a lot of curcumin and probably delivered through liposomal and nanotechnologies. So he's a great believer in stressing our system a little bit at a time. And to get a hold of Vincent, once again, his uh, email sites are www.vince.com. G-I-U-L-I-A-N-O dot com and www point G-I-U-L-I-N-O-A-R-T dot com and you can reach him at V-E-G-I-U-L-I-A-N-O at agingsciences.com. He's got a lot of research on this, and as he says, curcumin, as we discussed last week, is the answer to almost any condition in especially inflammation. He's got his own supplement, and it can be contacted through these means. Uh, sorry we lost him, but I want to encourage you to all go out and do your own research uh, so you can share it with others and help yourself and so we can all help others. And above all, be well. We got the power to change the world. Thank you for listening. Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs can be heard live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Here's to better health for you this week.